So how many um, people have read the book? Yeah, okay, the rest of you. Gotta potential check you gotta readers. check this out because you know what it, it's there's so many things in there you think you know the history and you go wait what um <laughs> I, and elaine let's start with like the biggest thing and i've heard so many people even come up to you this morning saying i had no idea that there was the, the women who were opposed to it and how long it took that that battle. So let's start with that fact that this did not happen overnight. This was seven decades. Seven decades uh, of, of really fearless, ceaseless work on behalf of ordinary women and their male friends, always, always really wonderful male champions of the cause. But it begins way before Seneca Falls. Seneca Falls is sort of the date that we, we date the movement from because it was the first sort of official public meeting. And it was in a Methodist church, the, the um, Wellesley Chapel. Um, pardon me, the Wesleyan Chapel, got my colleges wrong, the Wesleyan Chapel um, in Seneca Falls. And the women started, Elizabeth Cady Stanton had been thinking about this for, for years. Um, she had several little children, didn't have a lot of time to plan. And she and two or three friends uh, who were big time reformers and abolition workers decided they were going to call this meeting. And um, they had they planned it five days in advance. Who's made a dinner party? You know, five days. And, um, and there's 300 people there, including Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass was at Seneca Falls, which is really quite amazing. Um, and he plays a pivotal role. But this fight goes on until 1920. And even then, it, it's, um, there's a Supreme Court case where uh, there is a challenge to the 19th Amendment saying it goes against state law. So you realize, you know, my mom was born around this time. You realize it was not so long ago. Mm. And I think the surprise of my book for me, and I hope I convey that to my readers, is that it almost didn't happen. It really almost didn't happen. And it's very close and it's very bitter and you say, well, you know, like, by this time, you know, after seven decades of working on this and the federal amendment, which is the 19th Amendment, was in Congress stalled for 40 years. 40 years. And, you know, those of us who've lived through the tribulations of the Equal Rights Amendment, which was written by the women in my book, you will meet the women who write the Equal Rights Amendment, and it is introduced into Congress in 1923. It's been there for 96 years. Mm -hmm. And so you realize that an amendment can get really close to ratification. It, could, it can come very close, but not be able to go over the threshold. And that's what the suffragists feared if this battle in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, was not successful. So that's why it's such a um, a wild scene because everyone knows it's sort of the Alamo. Everyone knows that this is this is it. And if they don't win Tennessee, it's quite possible the amendment will die. I think another surprise people have is that there were women against this. You think, what? Mm -hmm. Women were against this? Um, so talk about the, the, the two. There, there's two groups who are fighting for this. And then yes. there's the women who are against this. So right. So, Tell us a little bit about those three different groups of sure. people. Sure. So, so the book follows three main characters. And it was one of those gifts of the writing gods to find that they, each of them arrived in Nashville Union Station on the same night. It was really great. And, uh, and I only learned that from reading the local newspapers. And so it follows sort of three streams of the fight. And one is Carrie Chapman Catt, the leader of the mainstream stream suffragists, the National American Women's Suffrage Association. She is the protege of Susan B. Anthony. Um, she had been tapped to lead the movement into the 20th century. And she comes down from New York from headquarters to lead this last battle. She's miserable. She does not want to be there, but she knows she has to. She's sort of the general. And then there's another wing of the suffrage, uh, the suffrage movement, um, the, the National Women's Party. That is Alice Paul's breakaway party. And here we see women organizing for the same cause, the same goal, and yet working 
separately. And so this happens historically. We should be so surprised when it happens uh, now. And they have different tactics. They have different staff. They have different strategy, but all for the same goal. So we have the young woman who Alice Paul sends to, to Tennessee to run their campaign. They're all staying in the same hotel. It really gets kind of wild. And then the third is Josephine Pearson, who is the leader of the Tennessee Women Opposed to Women's Suffrage. And so you learn about the women who opposed it. Um, she is aided by women from New York and Washington and Boston, which was, I hate to tell you, the hub of anti-suffrage women's organizations. Another surprise. Mm -hmm. mm. The, um, the, there was an association opposed to women's suffrage for a long time. Headquarters was here, was in Boston. Um, there was a publication called the Women's Remonstrance. And there were, they were very socially um, well-connected women for the most part. And they were vehemently against the idea of women being enfranchised. And we can discuss why yeah, that was. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, let's, let's talk about some of the reasons. Mm -hmm. Because this wasn't just a political battle, as you no. say. This was, this was a lot more. Yeah. And that's something that, that I began to realize. That although this was a huge political battle, and you have... Um, the presidential, you know, you have President Woodrow Wilson involved in this. He plays a big part in the story. The presidential candidates who were running for office in 1920, uh, Warren G. Harding and uh, James Cox, who is running with a young Franklin Delano Roosevelt for his vice presidency. So you have, uh, it's a very political story. But the argument, the debate, the fight over the idea of enfranchising women is more than just political, which is why it was so difficult. So it's more of a, it's really a cultural and a um, s social, and for some a moral issue mm -hmm. about the role of women in society. And so there is a group of women and they, they break out into sort of uh, emphasizing different aspects of this, but some feel that it will endanger the American family. That if women want to uh, feel equal to their husbands and their fathers and their brothers, this will imbalance the American family. And they see it as bringing about the moral downfall of the nation. So how will it, um, how will it endanger the family? They have all kinds of really interesting reasons. One, men, husbands and wives, there'll be more divorce because husbands and wives will, will argue about who to vote for. Now, I think they were, might have been right about that. Um, <laughs> they also say, well, women, if they demand the vote, and they demand going into what they call the public sphere, outside of the domestic sphere, meaning leaving the home, even to go vote. Well, who knows what they're going to want to do next. They might want to go to work. And so there are these amazing <laughs> broadsides uh, that I, I reproduce some of them in the book, um, showing women abandoning their families uh, to go either work for the vote or then to vote. So there's one called Election Day, and it shows um, a mother uh, you know, sailing off, and the husband is holding the screaming babies. He's always screaming. That's, That's always, always screaming. like the <laughs> ultimate insult. And, um, and she is going off to vote. And there's a sense that dads are going to have to take care of the babies if mom wants to go to vote. There's another, which is really my favorite, of, it's called America When Feminized. <laughs> and it, it's in the book. And it, it shows a rooster and a hen. And the hen is wearing a votes for women's sash. And she has just walked off the nest. And the rooster calls back and says, Ma, the eggs are going to get cold. And she, she calls over her shoulder, sit on him yourself, old man. My country calls me. <laughs> and and there's, there's several taglines, but my favorite of them is, a vote for the federal suffrage amendment is a vote for organized female nagging forever. <laughs> I think that's bumper sticker worthy. <laughs> Um, so you get a sense that this really was going to endanger um, 
gender relations. You know, we hear this again. We heard this with marriage equality. We hear this come up often. Um, this is going to imbalance how men and women work in the world. And so that was one strand of the anti-suffragists. Another, because this book takes place in Tennessee, is a southern strand, which was a racist strand mm -hmm. that said, uh, we don't want black women to be able to vote. And the 19th Amendment allows all women to vote. How it was implemented was something very different. But the 19th Amendment uh, does allow all women to vote. And that was going to, in their mind, disrupt um, their white society. So um, you have the, the cultural, uh, some, for some it's religious, because their clergymen are telling them that this is against the will of God, that God made um, Adam to be dominant over Eve, and to question that is against God's plan. And they use biblical um, teachings mm -hmm. and lessons to, to oppose women's suffrage. So there's lots of different strands going on besides the political uh, that cause women uh, uh, I guess we expect men, some men to be against uh, the idea of women voting, but it was really shocking to me that there would be yeah. women, and, and some very notable women, too. Right. The president's wife. Oh, yes. Um, yeah. President Wilson's wife, Edith Bolling Wilson, um, is at this time, when my book takes place in the summer of 1920, running the U.S. government because her husband has been incapacitated by a stroke and has been since October of that, the year before. And shes they've not told Congress what's going on. Even his vice president, Marshall, does not know what's the extent of his, his disability. And she's kept the, the government running. Um, and But she is vehemently opposed to the idea of women voting and, and tries to um, get Wilson to, to oppose uh, this idea. Politically, at this point, uh, it's advantageous for him to support it. But she's against it. But so is the wife of the vice president, presidential candidate, Fred, um, Franklin Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. Eleanor Roosevelt, at this time, is a 30-something-year-old mother of five little children. And she's never an anti-suffragist, but she never supports the movement. And in fact, when See, New York... surprises, so many surprises. Right, when New York State wins the vote by referendum in 1917, remember in these referenda, and there are, there are dozens of them around the country that go on for, for decades, uh, Massachusetts, by the way, in 1915, um, rejects the idea of women voting, but only men can vote in these referenda. So it's men, <laughs> men saying no. Um, and in, in 1915, Massachusetts had a referendum and voted no. But in 19, and so did New York, but New York goes again in 1917. Massachusetts was a lost cause and uh, they win. And so, Amer so New York women can vote. She lives in, in New York and Eleanor refuses to vote. And so the anti-suffragists actually court her and have a scene in my book where they are courting her to, uh, to join their side. That would be a really great get for them. Um, but she, she doesn't do that. Now, what happens soon after is after women do get the vote, she joins the League of Women Voters, becomes a protege of Carrie Catt, and that's her political career. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about Carrie Cat and Sue White, and the, you know mm -hmm. the, the same goal, and they have these different strategies, which are really interesting um, because sometimes they point fingers like you're going to ruin it. No, yeah, no, I got credit. <laughs> I did that. No, I did that. Yeah. Um, and they both feel that they are Susan Anthony's girls. Yes, everyone uh, wants and, to. Be. And um, Sue White, the, it, she's she's quite. That is quite an activist group, and they're the, like in your face. Yeah. So. The National Women's Party is this offshoot of the mainstream party. And we see this happen in so many reform or progressive movements. We see it happen with the labor movement. Remember the Wobblies um, get tired of waiting to organize peacefully and uh, take on some more radical and even violent methods. It happened in the British suffrage movement where Mrs. Pankhurst and her daughters go off and they really are violent. They break windows, they set off bombs, they, um, they, you know, attack public property. Um, and 
a young woman who trains with them named Alice Paul comes back to the U.S. and says, I'm going to blast this slow moving mm -hmm. movement uh, it, out of its lethargy. And so she says, we're going to just be confrontational. We are not going to ask politely anymore. We are not going to just plead. We're going to demand. We're going to march in the streets. We're going to picket the White House. We're going to burn the the president's words and burn him in effigy. Mm -hmm. um, they are disruptive. They are, you know, I tell you, I, I read about, I read about um, some young women in Congress right now and I say, wow, that's Alice Paul. <laughs> that, that is that disruptive and they were, you know, they were despised by both opponents of suffrage, uh, by the mainstream political um, uh, alliances, but also by the fellow suffragists who said, you're giving us a bad name. You are picketing the White House. You're calling Woodrow Wilson Kaiser Wilson during wartime. They called them treasonous. Mm. And they are imprisoned on, uh, you know, they're just exercising their First Amendment rights. They never were, in America, they were never uh, violent. Um, the most they did was picket. So there's no property damage. They're arrested for things like obstructing the sidewalk and lighting a match after sunset. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and they're hauled away in, in, in what, paddy wagons that were called Black Marias, and they are imprisoned in horrible circumstances, you know, vermin all over. Um, Alice Paul is put in solitary confinement. When they refuse to eat because they consider themselves political prisoners, they are force-fed with tubes rammed down their noses. They are, uh, again, they're tortured. They are, um, they're manacled to the wall. They are physically abused. Uh, Alice Paul serves months in prison. And in fact, she is threatened with uh, confinement to an insane asylum. Mm. They're trying to break her. Um, and so you see this more, I call it aggressive or radical approach, not militant, but a more radical approach, shaking it up, saying we can't wait any longer. A lot of these women are in their 20s and 30s. There are older women too, but they're just tired of waiting. It's been three generations and they don't want to wait anymore. And so they're willing to, to be much more in your face than their, you know, the, the prior generations were. And talk a little bit about um, Carrie Catt's frustration because, you know, here she's working, mind you, 20 nations have, women have the right to vote at 26 this time. 26 nations. 26, okay. 26. And um, there are even some women in the western part of the country oh, yeah. that can vote. Mm -hmm. So talk about her frustration. Here she's on this international level saying, what, why can't we? Oh, yeah. Carrie Catt's a fascinating character. Um, you know, school teacher from Iowa who becomes the head of the movement. And she's a master politician. Um, and she has been working half of her life in this movement, and finally they're on the cusp of victory, and she sees the dangers. She sees if they don't get it now, they may not get it. And here she has the Alice Paul and Sue White wing uh, being confrontational and kind of shaking it up and maybe endangering it because men found it very distasteful to have women not being ladylike in their protest. So... They, they, she she fears that, and then she sees the opposition massing. Uh, this again might be the last fight, and anti suffragists from all over the nation uh, come to Nashville. and And I think another thing that really surprised me was who was in that opposition. So we we've discussed the women who who feared the idea of of women's enfranchisement, but there were other really powerful forces. One of them, the political establishment, um, the political parties. There would be 27 million women eligible to vote and nobody knew how they'd vote. Mm -hmm. And the suffragists promise and threaten a woman's vote that's going to be monolithic, that's going to vote for their friends and punish their enemies. That never actually really happens. But they're able to threaten it because it's it's not realized yet. And of course, the politicians and the political parties fear this, fear this uh, kind of breaking the, the status quo. But then there was there's corporate interests. Mm -hmm. 
that are against women suffrage. And these include, again, it's going to be bad for their bottom line. Nothing new. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to be bad for their business. So the textile manufacturers are opposed to women's suffrage because women, if women can vote, if mothers could vote, it might mean that they will want to abolish child labor. And child labor, the textile mills in, in New England, as well in, as in the South, depend upon child labor and cheap women's labor. That's, that's how they do their business. And that's going to disrupt it. And then, of course, there's the, the liquor industry, which the women had always been um, associated with the temperance movement. And that's, for some, a moral issue. For others, a domestic violence issue. Because women couldn't press suit in court. They couldn't testify in court. So the only way was to kind of stop it at the tap and stop the flow of liquor from abusive husbands and fathers. So, um, so they're involved in the temperance movement. Prohibition is in effect in the summer of 1920. But what they're hoping is that if they can keep women away from the polls, that maybe it won't be enforced. It'll be kind of wink and nod, which is where how it was enforced in many states prior. Um, so they're hoping that keep the women away and it won't be enforced. And so we have that great scene in many scenes in the book of uh, the liquor industry establishes a speakeasy on the eighth floor of the Hermitage Hotel, where all all everybody is staying, the legislators, the suffragists, the anti-suffragists, and it's called the Jack Daniels Suite. Mm -hmm. And it dispenses liquor 24-7. Remember, prohibition's in effect. <laughs> and Carrie Katz says, is everyone in the legislature drunk? <laughs> and the reply uh -huh. is, yes, of course. <laughs> um, so they have to be thrown into the showers before they can you know, go up and be in the chamber to vote. Uh, so the liquor industry is trying very hard to get Tennessee to to not ratify. And how ironic that it came down to Tennessee. Oh, right? yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, I mean, it was just fluky, but it, it does yeah. come down to Tennessee. Yeah. And yeah, like you said, do or die. I want to see if there's any questions. I mean, I can keep going, but do any of you have any questions for Elaine? Okay. Well, if you think of some. Where, oh, yes. where, where, where's it? There's one over here. Oh. Over here. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Yes. Including New Zealand, they were mm -hmm. women's votes. Right. Um, and I believe Utah had the vote for mm -hmm. women so that they could maintain womanism. Yes. Um, did no one sort of look at all those places and go, their families are still okay? Oh, sure they did. Um, Carrie Catt, besides being the president of the National American Women's Suffrage Association, is also the president of the International Suffrage Alliance. So this is the the umbrella, worldwide umbrella group of all suffrage workers in every nation. And of course, they, they're in the wilderness for many years, but it starts to take, uh, to really move um, before and after World War I. And so, yeah, she, she really plays that card and says, 26 nations can already vote. Um, I think there were 10 states can already vote. Um, and the world has not come to an end. And in fact, in 1920, um, Russia had given their uh, women the vote after the revolution. Germany, who we had just defeated, had given women the vote. So it really got embarrassing. And she sure used that uh, to try to embarrass Congress uh, and then the legislatures. Um, and she gets really, you know, quite, quite angry about it. Was there pressure from the Mormons as well? Was there pressure from the Mormons is the question? Um, on... Uh, um, I think um, they had certainly supported it in in Utah. Um, I didn't see a, you know a great, but but it is interesting that the anti suffragists, when they um, you know rail against who is supporting suffrage, they'll say the socialists, um, the feminists, and the Mormons. So yeah, I guess yeah, they're yeah. <laughs> talk a little bit about how the image of of like especially Susan B. Anthony in the political cartoons, but also oh, yeah. I'm forgetting her name, the woman that they brought forward who ha was the lovely mother with the children. Oh, and Alice Thank Dudley. You. Yes, yeah. yeah. So from the beginning, and this will not shock anyone, um, the suffragists were uh, derided and insulted as being unladylike and unwomanly. And why would an attractive woman want to have 
the vote. I mean, a man will vote for her. So um, the suffragists are depicted, and I, I use some of these in the book and, and certainly in my talks, um, as just these really ugly, mannish women. That was the, the stereotype that was used. And so the suffragists have to kind of push back, and they bring forth the prettiest suffragists they can find. <laughs> and they really do. They do this all the time. And they're playing the game, too. Mm -hmm. And there's a woman in Tennessee named Ann Dallas Dudley, who is actually a leader in Tennessee. She's also on the National Association Board. Um, and she is this beautiful woman with two lovely children and a supportive husband. And they pump out her the photograph of her reading to her children uh, all over Tennessee. And I, you know, I was looking at that photograph. I said, oh, this is so, you know, so beautiful. And I understood why they did this. And then I was doing the math of how old her children would have been in 1920. And they were way out of the uh, the nursery. They were like 20 years old. <laughs> I said, wait a second, they're still using that photograph. But yep, they yeah. still were. Um, Susan Anthony, in, in the early depictions in, in the mid-19th century, is always depicted with a big, threatening umbrella. <laughs> And there's, there's a Life magazine uh, cover where she's impaling uh, the umbrella in some pol politician's chest. So she always has this threatening, I'm not going to go to the Freudian stuff, but she has this umbrella. <laughs> and, um, and after, at a certain point uh, around the 1890s, uh, you see a change when she becomes more respectable, when people begin to get the idea, yeah, you know, maybe this suffrage... Uh, Movement has a point. And so she's, she's depicted as much more, uh, you know, uh, non-threatening after that. But you see that, I mean, you see it happen in, in, um, in Tennessee. You see all these um, visuals where, you know, it, it's threatening. It's still threatening. And the way they use Susan Anthony in Tennessee is they um, give pictures of her with African-American friends and say, this is the woman you want. Mm. This is the movement uh, that personifies the federal amendment. You, you don't want that. Mm. Well, go ahead. I'm curious about your sources, mm -hmm. like regional sources versus other books. Did you from libraries? Or letters? Did you from other books? What did you find that was most interesting that you have not been discovered? Right. The, the question so, is about sources. Sources. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I do find it. Uh, gratifying when people write to me or, or come up to me and say, I loved your novel. <laughs> and and I, I take that as a great compliment. But then I have to explain. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a novel with 750 endnotes, but you don't have to read the endnotes. Um, it is very sourced, as they say. So every quote, um, every description comes from uh, research. Uh, one of the wonderful things is that the Tennessee State Archives actually saved every scrap of paper from this fight. Mm -hmm. I don't know how, they even had Carrie Katz uh, notes. So that was a gold mine. And I was able to go to Nashville and find that. Uh, so that has a lot of detail. The Library of Congress has the papers of both the um, National Association and the Women's Party. So I read those day to day. And so you have the women writing to headquarters and saying, the organizers in the field saying, this is what I did. This politician is double crossing us. This one promises, but it's not coming through. So I had their direct reports. Mm -hmm. The Schlesinger Library at, at uh, the Radcliffe Institute at Harvard, one of the great, great uh, repositories for women's history. And I spent many, many, many uh, very happy hours there. I always love to, to use that. Um, and they have papers. They have the Sue White papers, uh, some personal papers, some recollections of her. Um, they had um, papers of Betty Graham, who's one of the young organizers in her 20s, who's there. And her granddaughter, who, who lives uh, in the Boston area, just donated those papers. And she went through them with me. They hadn't been cataloged yet. So there's all of those primary sources. And then there's the newspapers, uh, which were very, very good. 
um, because they, are, they were excellent reporting. They had reporters there. And at that time, the reports are very thorough. And they have lots of quotes. And I was able to use that. The New York Times is one of the great anti-suffrage newspapers in America. Uh, the Boston Globe is OK. Not, you know, not, Christian Science Monitor is pretty good. Um, Baltimore Sun was terrible. So you, you had, in, in every city, because there were multiple newspapers in the cities, mm -hmm. you had um, usually pro-suffrage newspapers and anti-suffrage. And the reporting, for the most part, was straight, but you could see the influence of the editorial page. Mm. So those were the prime sources. I also found some descendants who were able to tell me some reminiscences. And of course, every, everyone else, the prime actors were gone. But uh, they had papers, not all of them. But some of them had written some memoirs. So I was able to tap all of those. Mm. And I, they were all listed in the book. Mm. <laughs> Anybody else have a question? There is some. Oh. There's a situation, you mentioned Utah on Mormonism. But Wyoming also mm -hmm. and I was wondering if there is a ideological difference, if you will. In the West? With women out West. Yeah. Mm -hmm. what yes. What are the factors contributing to their aggression right. regarding women's Yes, and you've hit upon something that's been, you know, studied for a long time. Why did the states in the West were the first to embrace suffrage? And it's absolutely true. If you see a, a map, you just see it, it's, it's in the West. The first, Wyoming being the first state to allow women to vote, uh, 1869, they had uh, women's enfranchisement as a territory. Now, there were about six women in Wyoming. <laughs> I, I shouldn't say that, but there were not very many. Mm -hmm. And part of this was a, an enticement. Come to the West. We have the pioneer spirit. And there certainly is that idea that they, you know, forged the West together with their, you know, men and women together. There, there is that element. But there's also the government used it. Come, you can vote here. Mm -hmm. So that, that is a big, big reason, too. And then you have the, the you know, in Utah, the sense that... Um, they would be able to enter. Again, their their polygamy was an issue, so they're trying to get more more voters. So it's very interesting. But then a place like Washington State has to go through several referenda before and Oregon before they agree. California it fails several several times until finally uh, approved in 1911, I believe. So you see it kind of slowly uh, come. I have to tell you, Massachusetts would have never, never approved mm -hmm. women's suffrage. Uh, one of your senators uh, was the leader, um, uh, Henry Cabot Lodge, mm -hmm. uh, leader of the anti-suffrage movement uh, in Congress, uh, in the Senate. So I don't think if it wasn't for the federal amendment, which as you'll see in my book, comes very close to failing, mm -hmm. um, I don't think women of Massachusetts would have the vote. Perhaps not today. I don't know. <laughs> Let's hope but not. you don't know. Because yeah. one of the things the suffragists feared was that the 1920s, they could see the pendulum was swinging. And the 1920s were very conservative politically. We think of it as the flappers, but it was really conservative. So they feared if they didn't get it then, who knows how long it would take. It probably would have taken decades more. I saw a hand over here. Yeah, go ahead. What about um, inheritance? Mm-hmm. Yes. Oh, yeah, that figures a lot. And it figures in the first part of the, the movement. The, the Declaration of Sentiments, which is the report that comes out of the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848, which is just a two-day convention, by the way. One, it's worth reading. It's such a, a modern document that Elizabeth Cady Stanton writes. It it protests the idea that women have to pay taxes, but they have no property rights. A, a married woman had absolutely no property rights of her inheritance, of her, of her land. She could not, um, she couldn't will her property. Single women had a little bit more, depending on the state, because it's state law. So the first things they go after, actually, is to change the property rights. Even if a woman, a married woman, had some wages, you know, made, made, candles or something, it belonged to her husband. Her children belonged to her husband. She had no custodial rights. And that slowly, slowly, they change with constitutional changes in the states, but it's very laborious. The 19th Amendment does not affect that. But the 
the beginning, it's much more of a feminist movement where they are going after lots of different issues, including my favorite, says right in the declaration, equal pay for equal work, 1848. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so there's this whole range. And then it kind of coalesces that it's just going to be the vote as the turnkey for all other changes. So they say, okay, let's just get the vote and then maybe we can work on these others. Okay. Did I see a hand? Oh, go ahead, right here. Pardon, I'm, I'm just... Yeah, um, it's a, when my book takes place in the summer of 1920, 35 states have, have ratified. They just need one more, just like the ERA. They just need one more. And through a series of, of court cases, and, and I, which I explained in the book, Tennessee turns out to be the one last best hope. Most of the other southern states have already rejected the amendment because it would allow black women to vote and it would, in their mind, abrogate states' rights. It's, a lot of this is re, replaying the Civil War. I mean, we're still replaying the Civil War. If you see the states that rejected the amendment and you look at the states that are impinging upon voting rights both historically and today, there's a lot of overlap. So it is a racial issue. Okay, Race one, is a big, big part of this story. One more question, Mary. Go ahead. I'm glad you brought up um, Virginia Voting Rights Committee because I wanted to add, you wrote about the Virginia Voting Rights Committee and how they were trying to impose rights on women who were already in the system. Do you see any a future of women who lose the right to vote? I'm sorry. Do you see a future of women who lose the right to vote? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, I do see some you know, crazy chatter that let's, let's repeal. I mean, prohibition was repealed. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I don't think that would happen, but certainly now the fight is for all citizens. It's not just women. It is, there is a, there is a uh, assault on our voting rights right now. And I think it's our responsibility. If there's anything this book, I think, can do is to show us how precious it is, how hard fought it is. Of course, black women in the South wouldn't be able to vote for another 45 years until the Voting Rights Act. And that Voting Rights Act has now been, you know, um, gutted by Supreme Court decisions. So we're back, we've gone back a few spaces on this. And the idea that voting is kind of settled and taken care of and is a right and privilege of democracy is still being debated. I think one of the things, the themes of my book is that we are still debating democracy and whether we can handle true democracy. Mm -hmm. And that's what the book was about. That's what the fight is about. And it's still going on. And there's a lot of other surprises we didn't talk about. So I'm telling you, pick up the end. <laughs> Elaine is going to be outside signing books. And we should also mention the Women's Suffrage Celebration Coalition of Massachusetts and the Greater Boston Women's Vote Centennial. They've got a table set up outside and they invite you to stop by and, and see what they have to offer. Yeah. Can I just yeah, say as a, a second? So um, the book is uh, also an audio book, which is great because uh, the, the, the reader gives voices to all these wonderful characters. So it's, it's really it's really fun. And then it is going to be oh, the TV, a, a, TV yeah, series. So, so one of my readers, one of my readers was Secretary of State Hillary Rodham Clinton. And she got in touch with me and said, this is an important story. I didn't know this. And we've got to get this story out to the largest audience possible. Um, so she asked me to partner with that, her. Uh, that was very agreeable to me. And we, we, she brought the idea to her friend Steven Spielberg. And so his uh, television production unit is developing it. And so that's... Can I just say, were you pinching yourself when you got Hillary Rodham Clinton? <laughs> it was, it was, yes, I was certainly <laughs> pinching myself. It was pretty amazing. But she's very, very involved in all of it. Um, again, thinks this is an important story. So that's been, uh, and it's going to be a, a middle grade readers uh, oh, book great. next year. So that's, that's great. You mean we're finally going to read about it in school? <laughs> yes. Yeah, you know that it is not on the curriculum of many, many states. And even in Tennessee, someone wrote to me and said, we're having to battle, and in Michigan, 
battle to get this on the curriculum. Yeah. Women's suffrage, it's usually one sentence, and it is, in 1848, women met at Seneca Falls, and in 1920, they were given the vote. Yeah. That's how there it goes. There you go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it. you want to know all the details, pick up uh, Elaine's Thank book. you so much. Thank, this has really been great. Coming.